Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, at least for a couple more weeks anyway. And uh, we have a great show today. Uh, one of the big benefits I have of doing the job that I do here in Hawaii is I get to travel from time to time. And I've, I've said in the past couple of shows, I was in D.C. for uh, annual merit review with Department of Energy um, and did a presentation there uh, along with my partner, Dave. And um, we've, we've been to several great events. And one really, really good event that I, I is etched in my mind forever is, uh, was in New York City in 2017 in September, um, where I was there representing the state of Hawaii um, for two big events. The Department of Energy was rolling out um, a thing they called Hydrogen at Scale. And it was also one of the first meetings of uh, the Hydrogen Council, which was a brand new uh, international council that was stood up in early 2017 to promote hydrogen on an international level and help scale it up. So the D Department of Energy and the Hawaii Hydrogen Council uh, efforts were in parallel, and then they were coming together there. And I got to meet a, a bunch of great folks, including my guest today, uh, Rafael Chauvin, who, um, who is, uh, I just can't even get into his background. It's so, it's so broad, but he's done everything from the corporate technology officer for NG, one of the largest energy companies in the world. Uh, he's been involved with government agencies. He's, he's just a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes specifically to hydrogen. And uh, so, Rafael, welcome to the show today. I really appreciate it. And the audience really needs to understand that this is a long shot for us. We're actually have Rafael in Nice, France, on the, on the, on the, the French Riviera down there on his vacation at midnight, live, streaming live into the show. So I, I just really... I thank you so much for taking that kind of time and effort to be on the show here. It really, uh, it humbles me greatly. Thanks, Stan, uh, for welcoming me. And I mean, we, we are both uh, looking at uh, the ocean. Makes us think about, you know, wind, sun, and producing hydrogen from water. There you go. Well, when your family gets a little bit older and you can travel out this way, bring them on out and we'll... We'll get them on horseback riding and we'll go up and do some fishing and maybe even teach them how to surf and things like that. And uh, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it a, a memorable trip for them. But anyway, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background and, and some of the things you've, you've done in your life to, uh, to get you to the level you're at right now? Yeah, thanks, Dan. You already mentioned uh, a few things. So I have been 10 years a, a civil servant and by then I... I did different things like uh, I headed uh, the economic development of uh, the northern region of France. I worked for the European Commission and I also was the diplomatic advisor at a certain time of the French uh, energy uh, telecommunication industry minister. So a bit like uh, the equivalent of your uh, DOE. And uh, then I went to the corporate sector, did also a different number of things for 15 years. And as you mentioned, I work for this uh, large utility, uh, NG, uh, being first uh, head of China, and then uh, in my last position, uh, CTO of, any, of the company. And uh, so my role, uh, you can compare uh, in the United States, this company as a large utility like uh, your Reliance, Dynegy, or, or other ones, but you know, active worldwide in 70 countries. And so my job was to really travel the world and talk to amazing people like you that are, you know, at the frontier of new technologies, uh, really all over. And step by step, I realized that together with the teams, uh, even though we, you know, we had worked in new labs, like setting up, you know, batteries lab, storage lab, drones lab, 3D printing labs, artificial intelligence, cyber security labs. So the new stuff, the, the addressing the new topics that you need to work upon, uh, I realized then that uh, hydrogen and fuel cell was actually a topic still a little bit in the shadow, but with a very, very interesting future. And I got interested to the point that step by step, I worked on it and I got engaged with more and more people in Europe. And I make it short, I became elected uh, chairman of uh, Hydrogen Europe, which is the European Association of all the players active in this field. And when you are in that position, you also chair the European funds that is backing 
this industry, a bit like the DOE budget uh, in the United States. And this I did for three years. And uh, it is by then that uh, at the initiative of my predecessor, who is the current Secretary General of the Hydrogen Council, uh, we uh, created, it was an initiative of Hydrogen Europe, uh, now it's a private initiative from a certain number of uh, industrials, uh, this Hydrogen Council that you referred to, uh, Stan, uh, which was uh, launched in Davos in 2017, uh, which was quite an amazing initiative because for the first time you had an array of launch in 100 companies, by then it was only 14, now you have more than 50 companies, about 30 that are Fortune 100 and another 25 that are not, uh, that are engaged in uh, saying hydrogen will be key in the future of energy. And then to continue on that adventure, uh, having been 10 years a civil servant, 15 years in the corporate world, I considered that I needed to be an entrepreneur to have the opportunity to help any uh, company any uh, institution, uh, either public or financial, or any startup uh, that wanted to get more interested in that field, uh, to help them, I needed to be uh, independent. And so that's what I did. I left uh, my position in the corporate world and became uh, an entrepreneur. And as a first company, I have created Hydrogen Advisors, which does what, uh, what it says. And next to them, I'm also working on an array of uh, projects. So that's where I am. That's really great, and, and it's an inspiration to me because uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of uh, time in civil service and also in the military, and so I, I have two retirements already behind me, and I'm getting ready to leave state civil service right now and, uh, and actually be more really retired. I'll be moving to the Big Island and working on hydrogen projects with a lot of people on the Big Island where, where we expect to see hydrogen really taking off. So. I'm sure you and I will be talking a lot in the future about uh, the things that we're going to do here in Hawaii uh, revolving around hydrogen. But, you know, the Hydrogen Council for me was a really impressive um, group. And as you said, they've grown dramatically from 2017 to over, well over 50 members, almost approaching 60, I think now. And these are not right. just little companies. They're, they're like Shell Oil, um, Total Oil, uh, Kawasaki, Honda, Toyota. Um, just big, big, big name companies, Air Liquide, Plug Power, um, companies that do hydrogen for their business and companies that do vehicles and transportation and heavy equipment, um, electrolyzers, fuel cells. It's, it's really grown. But, you know, from your perspective, how important has this Hydrogen Council been in reaching that goal of getting hydrogen to be ubiquitous, to to really take its role and be a leader in uh, energy storage and, and energy in the world? I think what is absolutely, what has, was a tilting point in 2017 with this creation is that for the first time, you have major energy companies. So you mentioned Shell, but there's also Total, NG, uh, also industrial gas companies like uh, you mentioned Ali Kid, but there's also Linda, sitting together with major car manufacturer, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and others, and also um, companies that are developing other types of uh, you know transport application like Alstom for train, and saying, you know, hydrogen is common to us all. It is a new energy vector. It is a new fuel. It is the gaseous equivalent of green electrons when you produce it via electrolysis. And so we have here a new approach, which is extremely strong because you come with CEOs from companies that are from different sector and say, this is something major and new. But 2017, was only a, a starting point. I think that uh, 2018 is an even more interesting year. Uh, if, you, if I can compare is, you know, the creation of the Hydrogen Council was a bit before the coming wave of more political engagement. So what happened in 2018? 
you have had an array of very important ministerial meetings. You have to have in mind that these CEOs, when they created the Hydrogen Council, their main target was to engage with top politicians, energy ministers, transport minister, uh, finance ministers, potentially head of states, telling them, you know, this is like moving from steam to power. We are now here with hydrogen, this new energy vector. And in 2018, you have had a certain number of major moves coming from energy ministers. One of the key ones was in 2018, in June 2018, you had Mission Innovation that decided to work on hydrogen and fuel cells. So what is Mission Innovation? It is the meeting of 23 ministers of 23 countries that have declared themselves as engaged in tackling climate change after the COP21. And they're also joined by the European Commission, who is number 24. And these people had, in the early days of mission innovation, thought about hydrogen and fuel cell, but no country really wanted to take the lead on having a group working on that. And it's, we had to wait until last year for it to happen. And so uh, in June 2018, uh, in Sweden, they announced that they would start working on this topic. And then uh, a little bit later, in September, you had all the energy ministers of Europe were gathered for an informal meeting in Linz, Austria, who signed a declaration, the Linz Declaration, saying that hydrogen will be part of the future of Europe. But that was not all. You had then a third meeting taking place in November in Tokyo, which was the first energy ministers at worldwide level meeting focused on hydrogen. So it's absolutely amazing, you know, in, within six months, you had one year after the creation of the Hydrogen Council, a kind of response from energy ministers. And now there is more coming in 2019. It's been an amazing thing to watch. And, you know, we're out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, surrounded by um, our own political issues locally and looking at our, our national level political issues with our president and our Congress all fighting about things. And we're, we're not hearing and not seeing um, the, a lot of the issues that, that you just talked about that, that are going to be game-changing, world-changing events that will suddenly pop on America's horizon. And my fear is that the United States is going to be playing catch-up because uh, it's not just Europe that's, uh, that's really leading the charge on hydrogen, but um, China is very much focused on hydrogen to combat their pollution issues. Japan is focused on hydrogen because they want to they wanna divest themselves of nuclear power. And um, South Korea is looking into hydrogen because they see it as an emerging market for their industry to step into with their Hyundai vehicles and, and other equipment. <clears throat> so the, the work of the Hydrogen Council and the, and the organizations you just highlighted, it's kind of going unseen in the United States. And that was one of my main reasons for reaching out to you for today's program was to try and help bring that awareness to the American public that you, we can either start to recognize what's going on worldwide and understand it and, uh, and be part of it, or we can play catch up to the rest of the world. And you know, I looked at your website um, as you started your, your hydrogen advisors, and I was really, um, the, first, the very first image that came up, uh, you were talking about why hydrogen specifically is the answer. And, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that because, of course, I agree with you that I think hydrogen is the answer. And I, I've been criticized by, by people of, that I'm too focused on hydrogen. I need to look at other things, too. And it's like, I understand batteries. I, I understand flywheels. I, I understand other technology. But for me, hydrogen is the answer. And, and it looks like you, you feel that way as well. So can you spend just a few seconds talking about that? Of course. Uh, but first, I would like to comment on what you said, uh, which is uh, United States watching. I do not believe that the United States is watching. I mean, you have spent a lot of efforts and money over the past 10, 20 years on this technology, and that will surface in due time. Okay. What is happening right now as we talk, and we, we, you know it as I know it, is that 
there is a meeting taking place in Tokyo, which is the G20. And during that meeting, energy ministers will mainly talk about hydrogen because the International Energy Agency has prepared a report to that extent. And so the fact, the mere fact that the International Energy Agency has worked for now more than half a year on preparing that report and becoming vocal was an article in the Financial Times and also in other major newspapers last week announcing it will be a game changer and it will have rollover effect everywhere at utilities level. I was invited by the Edison Institute about a month ago to, to give a, a lecture, um, you know, in, um, in a conference. And I could see how many, you know, large uh, companies from North America were interested by hydrogen. So it's coming. Now, coming back to what you asked me, why do I believe that hydrogen uh, is key? Very simple. If we look at greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, and we know that 20% of the emissions are coming from agriculture and forestry, and 80% are coming from energy. So if there is something that we need to do for the planet, is to focus on the energy part. And then when we look at the energy part, most of the politicians will tell you, you know, if we want to green our energy, we need to go for green electrons, green power, more wind, more sun, but they tend not to mention that electrons and electricity is only 20 to 25% of our daily energy world. We consume mainly energy in other forms, in the form of solid like wood and coal, form of gas like natural gas or in the form of liquids like gasoline so in combustion processes where we shoot co2 in the air particles noxious and toxins and so it's great that we talk about electric mobility it's great that we talk about more solar and wind farm i love it it's great that we talk about batteries but we should not forget that 80 percent of the world of energy is combustion based so in that word of solid liquid and gaseous fuels if we want to stop shooting co2 in the air and particles we need to go for the only one of that family that hasn't got any carbon atom in it and physics and chemistry tell us there's only one which is hydrogen now you can be a believer in climate change or not so i'm going to take it on the other from another perspective let's forget about climate change and just explain why hydrogen is going to be like you know cocaine once you're going to have sniffed it, you're going to wish to, to stay with it. Everybody wants to have clean air in cities. And we know that pollution in city comes from transport. If you want to have clean transport and silent transport, you have no way but to go for electrical-based transmission power. And then if you want to go short distance, you can go with batteries. If you want to go long distance, you don't want to carry batteries in trains. Exactly. You don't want to carry batteries in trucks around. You just want to have space for goods and people. And that's where hydrogen plus a fuel cell comes in and gives you a proper solution to have an electrical powertrain plus range, usually over a thousand miles. And so it's a no-brainer knowing that hydrogen now will be produced at a price which is competitive with gasoline. Because prices of electrolyzer are going down following exponential curves like wind farms, prices have gone down, and solar panels, prices have also gone down. So it's not even a question of climate change. It's just going for something that is silent, without emissions, great, with a great experience. And hydrogen is not only about mobility, it's also about heating in homes. Right. It's also about developing energy uh, independence. So there are many, many angles uh, from which you can look at it. But I would say those are the two main angles uh, I would suggest uh, to follow if you want to have a proper look at what uh, hydrogen is. Uh, and, and then I'd what say, I say... Well, yeah. I'd say that when I looked at your uh, website and I saw that, that position you're taking, which you've just articulated well, um, 
it, it just brought everything together. And, you know, I actually sat down at my desk several weeks ago and just started drawing, you know, kind of a mind map of why hydrogen and making all the connections, producing oxygen for medical uses, you know, everything, transportation, grid, stability, storage, and all the places it connected. And you're right, when you paint that picture, if I could, if I could get a canvas and paint a picture, everybody would be wondering why the heck we're using fossil fuels. But I tell you, we have to take a quick break here and come back with you, Rafael, and uh, we'll have about 10 more minutes to, to, to wrap this up and, and talk about further what you just explained. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour as usual. And uh, we're talking to, uh, he looks pretty awake, but I'm surprised he's not a little bit sleepier. Uh, Raphael Chauchin from, from Nice, France on his vacation at midnight. Actually, probably quarter after midnight, 20 after. And um, he's, he's just a wealth of knowledge. And I looked at his website and, and it pulled so much together for me in terms of, uh, you know, I'm always having to explain to people the advantages of hydrogen. And, and um, I've gotten a kind of a reputation as being pretty much just bullish on hydrogen. But there's so, so many reasons it makes sense. And the more I learn, um, the more these reasons just pop into, into my logic and say, this is the way to go. And obviously, uh, Raphael is in, in the same mindset. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the economics. You, know, you started telling us that, that the cost of producing hydrogen and the cost of producing clean energy with solar and wind is coming down to the point where it, it makes economic sense. My fear, though, is that we'll kind of just take a, a nice steady pace at it. And in the meantime, if we have some kind of fossil fuel crisis of any kind, whether it's a, a hurricane in Houston that shuts down uh, refineries in the U.S. or a Middle East crisis or whatever, that we're going to be in the crisis mode. And at that point, we currently use those same fixed fuels that you talked about to build infrastructure for hydrogen or build components or do the industrial piece of hydrogen. And it will make adopting hydrogen go even slower if we wait for the crisis. Could you talk a little bit about the, the economic balance of, of how fast we move into hydrogen and, and how we do it? Well, if you look at the prices, of, if you look at the prices of electrolyzers and the size of electrolyzers, they are following the same kind of curves that we have seen 15 years ago uh, in the solar uh, arena and 10 years ago in the wind uh, energy arena. So uh, we are now in a situation where the price of hydrogen coming of electrolyzer is not anymore driven by the price of electrolyzer itself, but by the price of power. And we can foresee to be in the next five years, five to 10 years, in a range of, I'm um, mentioning Euro, but Euro USD is somehow uh, similar, uh, two to four euros uh, per kilo. And today, as uh, we talk together, Stan, uh, I want to tell you about a project that landed, which is the some players in Europe over the past three years wanted to develop uh, hydrogen buses in cities in Northern Europe and do it at scale. The problem is that uh, a diesel-based or gasoline-based bus costs roughly around, um, let's say, 300K USD. 
And today you can buy hydrogen buses around 500k USD on the European market. And then we have seven suppliers, there's not yet a lot of them, so they need to hand build them somehow and cost quite a bit of money. And an additional 200k is a lot for a city to pay. So those people, uh, an array of companies, uh, they decided to talk to the bus suppliers and ask them, would you be able to lower your prices if you would build more of them? They said, yeah, we need orders uh, of 100 or, or plus. And then the price could do, go down to 400K, roughly. But this is still not enough. It should be 350K for a city to buy. Then they would be okay to pay the additional 50K because this is a clean bus compared to a gasoline-based one. And what those companies did is they went to the European Commission to ask for a subsidy for the remaining 50K to bring the prices down to 350K. Then you will be surprised why I am not telling you anything about the price of fuel. And the reason is that that's not where the problem is. Because with the current electrolyzer technology, compression technology and filling station technology, different arenas in which we have quite a lot of players in Europe, they can on the northern market in Europe, where renewable power is abundant and cheap, produce hydrogen at a price point which is the same as gasoline prices. So it's not a problem of fuel cost, it's just a problem of the equipment. And if we go now with increased production sizes, uh, with hydrogen trucks, and you have some leaders uh, worldwide in the United States, you have also other players in the other areas, Asia and Europe. If we have now you know, more production of hydrogen-based trucks, hydrogen buses, hydrogen cars, we will be you know, in a situation where the fuel is at price and the vehicles are also at price. So I'm very confident that all this is going to develop. Well, that's, that's really a, an interesting thing. Here in the US, I think we're not quite there with the fuel piece. Um, and I think it's because our, a lot of our economy is subsidizing, continually subsidizing fuel. Like, for example, what is the price of gasoline in France now? Um, how, many, how many euros per liter? Or, you know, give us an idea. Well, it's around uh, 1.6. 1, 1, 1, uh, 1. Okay. But, you know, we have had a lot of issues because it, it's difficult to compare things, you know, because we have a lot of taxes on fuels. And so it depends from one country to the <laughs> other one. Let's put it this way, hydrogen is in the range. There's a very interesting uh, study by Shell uh, on the internet on hydrogen showing that hydrogen is in the prime range in terms of fuel, of uh, other alternative fuel being LNG or you know, diesel for, for trucks. So, um, and I can give you another example. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, starting in September, you will have uh, a deployment of a fleet of 1,600 hydrogen trucks in Switzerland. And this is done without any subsidy. Why? Because trucks that are emitting CO2 in Switzerland have to pay a tax when they cross the country. And so uh, as this truck will not have to do it, it's economical. And it will just happen without subsidy. So I think what we need to keep in mind is that this economy of hydrogen is happening with, and it's happening much faster than one think. And yes, it's going to be a competition between Asian, European, and American players, but I also believe that there will be a lot of cooperation. And what is also starting now that we didn't touch upon it, we start to see the first structuring deals, like you know, acquisition or M&A uh, in a magnitude of tens and millions of dollars. And once you have reached that threshold, you know, it can only grow. So, 2018 was already an interesting year. You may have a look on the media part of my website, hydrogenadvisors.com. I did a review of everything that happened in 2018 to another one in 2019. And I'm absolutely convinced that what 2019 is going to give us is going to be even more astonishing than everything else that happened before. And we are really now at a tilting time with that hydrogen economy. Well, I'm, I'm going to encourage our viewers to do that, to look at Hydrogen Advisors, that's all basically one word, dot com, uh, to check out uh, your website because I found it fascinating. And, uh, you know, we're, we're at 30 minutes already, Rafael, and, 
And uh, I really, Time flies. it does fly so fast, but I'm so glad we had a chance to talk today. And you can now go to sleep uh, and get some rest and enjoy the rest of your beach time with your family. But uh, don't forget, when the girls are a little older, uh, you'll, have con you'll have my phone number. You can call me up and uh, tell me when you're getting here, and we'll make sure that we get you out to the beach and, uh, and let the girls have a great experience. So thank you so much for your Thanks. insight on hydrogen. And uh, we hope to see you soon. And I'll have you on the show again. We have lots more to talk about. Thanks, Stan, and I also look forward to see what's going to happen uh, in uh, Hawaii in the field of hydrogen because you have a fantastic playground there and you'll do already amazing things. And there's more to come. Okay, if you can do me one favor is talk to those guys at Hyundai and tell them it's time to send their, their cars out. We have um, Toyota already has some Mirais out here. We need to get Hyundai out here. So if you can do that for me, I'd love it. And then you can charge me a small premium for that as, as your advisor. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rafael. And aloha from Hawaii and aloha to my viewers until uh, next Friday. It's Stan, the Energy Man.